So welcome, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. My name is Colin Pele. I'm a clinical pharmacologist and I run programs to strengthen science capacity in Africa and low and middle income countries. It's my honor this, this uh, morning, this afternoon to chair today's meeting convened by the H3D Foundation and IFPMA. Um, a few years ago on a trip to Cape Town, South Africa, I was at dinner with two friends when my phone rang with a call from my niece, Mandy, uh, a human resources professional. Now, anyone who knows Mandy or has a niece with a similar phenotype knows that you ignore those calls at your own peril. So normally when I'm with, uh, at, at a dinner with friends, I would put my phone off. But what I did this time was to apologize to my dinner guests, step away and take the call. So now my niece wanted to share with me breaking news, uh, breaking news that she had just seen. A lab in South Africa had discovered a cure for malaria. She was excited, animated, and bubbling forth with her words. She says, this is big, Connor, really big, not just about malaria, but to show the world that we in Africa can do it. It, it puts us on the map. Uh, I, I see big follow-up things for inspiring our youth, job creation, for science. So I gently interrupted her to say that one of my two dinner guests was actually Kelly Chibale, the head of the lab that had discovered MMV-048, the anti-malarial drug that she was talking about and that had just hit the news. Now, most of the people on this call know that discovering new drugs and making them into therapies is a slow and inefficient process. You know, only one in a thousand or one in 10,000 molecules that are discovered make its way into clinical testing. And, and this statistic actually comes from pharma, you know, the group that IFPMA represents. So the collective African excitement that my niece was, was displaying, that an academic lab had discovered a drug for a disease like malaria in Africa, which as you know, is home to about 94% of global malaria cases and deaths. This is, this is big. So over the next 19 minutes or so, we'll hear more about this remarkable story. Uh, in the process of doing this, the panelists will tell you more about sketching the context of health innovation in Africa and why partnerships like the one being launched today between H3D and, and pharma are necessary. You, you'll hear recurring themes about models for sustainable capacity strengthening, and you will hear calls about how you can help to strengthen the science capacity on the continent by investing in organizations like the H3D Foundation. So I'm, I'm as excited as you are to hear more. Uh, let me hand over now to our moderator, Kerry. Uh, Kerry is the editor for Health Policy Watch. Uh, this is an independent network of journalists who report on leading global health trends. And she will get, get us started, and then I will come back again at the end to pull some closing remarks together. Uh, Kerry, over to you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. I actually live in Cape Town, so and I've, I've visited the H3D facility myself and seen its impressive capacity. So it's a big day for our city, our country, and for the continent. I'm delighted to be moderating this. We have a really exciting agenda with lots of, of um, important people celebrating the, this, this partnership between the H3D um, Foundation and, and the IFPMA. The session is being recorded. If you need any more information about the speakers or the institutions, there are notes in the chat and links. Um, you will also have a chance to ask questions. After the panel discussion, we'll take 15 minutes of, of questions, so please do put them in the chat. Um, and we forgive stray pets, strange noises, because we know that some of us are working at home. So please turn a blind ear to those and I. Um, to kick us off today, Greg Perry is going to introduce the session. He's the Assistant Director General of the IFPMA, responsible for outreach and stakeholder engagement in global health. And he has a long history of working for better patient access to medicines as the former Executive Director of the Medicines Patent Pool 
and the director, former director general of the European Generic Medicines Association. Greg, over to you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And first, thank you very much for Colin for putting this whole thing into the very clear human perspective about what all innovation, science and what we're all involved in. I just want to welcome everybody who is joining this uh, panel uh, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are on the planet. We are delighted by the number of people and the cross section of registrations we've had uh, from academia, from public health, uh, from the private sector, um, and showing the sort of broad interest there is in this critically important area. I, I'm delighted that today we are going to launch this partnership which, with the uh, H3D uh, Foundation. I'm delighted to do so in the context of this panel discussion around st uh, strengthening capacity building uh, and health innovation in Africa. Now, this partnership and, and the event that we're holding today, um, and there will be several other events based on this partnership as well, looking at innovation in Africa. But this is part of the overall IFPMA uh, engagement in Africa, and in particularly in helping in the development of an African innovation ecosystem. Now, this is not just about partnerships between the global industry and uh, local uh, innovation. In that itself, it is good, but it's more than that. It's about, it's about encouraging, supporting, leveraging local innovation in Africa. Uh, wherever that will be in the continent. And we very much appreciate the work which H3D Foundation is doing, not just for South Africa, but for the whole of the continent. Africa's future, it lies in its innovation, it lies in its science, it lies in its entrepreneurship, it, it lies with its youth, uh, empowering uh, young innovators and young women. And all these issues are part of what we are trying to do at IFPMA as part of our African engagement strategy. I'd just like to, to finish by um, thanking all the panelists for their time and their contribution today. I'd like to thank uh, the team at IFPMA, uh, Belinda, who is guiding uh, this partnership. I'd like to thank uh, Natra, who's doing all the work behind the scenes in this panel. But I'd particularly like to thank uh, Guilherme Sintra, who is a director of innovation, who developed this idea um, with Professor Kelly um, uh, some time back, and now we're seeing the fruits of those ideas. And finally, I, I just like to give a, a great warm thanks uh, to Kelly, uh, to Colin, to the whole team at H3D, and uh, we're very much looking forward to the collaboration, cooperation, and partnership with yourselves. So back to yourself, Kerry. Thanks so much, Greg. To, to start with, we have two really top, top um, leaders who, who are going to give us um, recorded messages um, in, in support of, of, of the launch of today's partnership. And you will see from the, the quality of the people, it will indicate the level of confidence in H3D and the, and the possibilities and excitement around the possibilities that, they, that, that it offers. The first is from Francis Collins, who's the director of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He's um, renowned for his landmark discovery of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project. And the second speaker will be Trevor Mandel, who's the president of global health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he works on high impact interventions to address the leading causes of death and disability in developing countries. Um, so let's have the, 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 the messages from them. Greetings, everyone. I wish we could have all met together in person to launch this enterprise, but I commend the organizers for doing what they can with virtual technology to move this partnership forward. Yeah, the COVID public health crisis has certainly created havoc in all kinds of schedules, including mine, but I'm really pleased to be able to be here to give these recorded well wishes to those who are involved in this very impressive new development. The launch of the H3D Foundation and the IFPMA partnership, bringing together African scientific experts in drug discovery and development with leaders in the pharmaceutical industry is a very concerns, not only for infectious diseases, 
but for health innovation across Africa. I had the good fortune to meet Kelly Chivali in Durban several years ago at the African World Economic Forum and had a chance uh, as a result of that to establish a joint venture with NIH's National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS, uh, to characterize a multi-stage anti-malarial drug molecule. This is just one of several competitive projects, uh, cooperative projects between NIH and H3D, extending to novel drug targets and molecular entities for TB as well as malaria. Notably, H3D plays a pivotal role in the TB drug accelerator to develop preclinical drug candidates. And we have jointly developed a lead series in fact, this very week, NIH is testing on campus one of those H3D lead molecules in our non-human primate TB model. And our TB labs regularly host H3D postdocs, so we are connected. H3D is indicative of a wave of scientific innovation emerging in Africa, driven by a generation of young entrepreneurial and globally competitive scientists. Colleagues consider it a model for innovative research. It's changing expectations of what people believe is possible on the continent. So building an integrated African research platform will advance translational science capacity and infrastructure, leading to improved therapeutic development and outcomes. The timing of this partnership between H3D and IFPMA is right on target and for several reasons. First, as this audience so well knows, private sector R&D investment in therapeutics for endemic diseases of Africa has a mixed history due to lack of commercial incentive, among other factors. This new catalyst of progress will be African academic institutions forging partnership with the pharmaceutical industry, just what's needed, also including philanthropic organizations and governments. Second, Africa is rising. And so a large influx of pharma support for clinical research and trial funding on the continent is anticipated over the next years. If allocated wisely, this represents a ripe opportunity to strengthen clinical and translational research networks. Third, this can build on other networks. Initiatives such as the Human Health and Heredity in Africa, or H3 Africa, which I had something to do with the founding of this and which is jointly funded by NIH and the Wellcome Trust, that supports a trans-African collaborative network of 30 countries and enables high quality genomics research on the continent. So new knowledge on African specific disease and pharmacogenetics is essential for development of therapeutics as well as diagnostics and H3 Africa is there as a partner with H3D and this new announcement uh, of the partnerships uh, that we're talking about today uh, with IFPMA. And then lastly, we're experiencing a growing and promising trend in clinical development partnerships in Africa from vaccines and simple antibodies to uh, non-communicable diseases, cardiometabolic disease drug development. All of this will require cross-disciplinary teams leveraging both industry and academic technology platforms and expertise. So a sustainable African biomedical research enterprise is not only a broad benefit to African countries, but let's be clear, to the whole global health community. After all, the problems this group tackles are not exclusively African health challenges, but global challenges to reduce disparities in health, improve life expectancy and quality of life, and even the poorest communities. So let's build on the momentum this launch represents and work together to realize a future where African institutions are the primary sources of research solutions to the health problems in the region. I believe in that. On behalf of all my colleagues at NIH, thanks for the chance to take part in the launch of this very significant partnership. Can we have um, Trevor Mandel's message next, please?
Thanks, Francis. And great to be with you all. And many thanks to Professor Chibali and to Assistant Director General Perry for inviting me to this exciting launch of the H3D Foundation and IFPMA partnership. It's hard not to first recognize the moment we're in, the roller coaster we've been on over the last 12 months of this pandemic, as we've careened from the high of developing safe and effective COVID vaccines in under 10 months to the lows of the tragic inequality in their delivery, leading to ever more contagious variants circling the globe. With only 3% of Africa's population fully vaccinated, 28% in South Africa, compared with around 55% in the US and 65% in the UK. This unacceptable differential in access further underscores the pressing need to strengthen health innovation in Africa to deliver safe, effective and quality medical products when and where they are needed most. To do this, more collaboration and partnerships between industry, academia and government are needed to address this current crisis, as well as long-standing health inequities. And why for our part, we're focused on supporting pharmaceutical sciences in Africa through workforce and capacity skill set development and strengthening long-term infrastructure and regulatory systems. There's much work to be done and tapping into the depth of expertise in industry and government will be key. For example, today there are only two level three regulatory systems in Africa in Ghana and Tanzania for drugs, but none in fact for vaccines. As H3D Foundation and IFPMA consider the opportunities before them, two partnership models in particular may provide some inspiration for building a vibrant drug discovery ecosystem in Africa. They shine a light on what's possible when researchers, mentors, funders and collaborators from different sectors and different geographies bring different perspectives and priorities for how a tough problem should be solved. The first is the TB drug accelerator, TBDA. This was designed as a groundbreaking partnership between six pharmaceutical companies, a biotech, 14 research institutes, and a product development partner to cure TB in under two months with a regimen of new and more effective drugs. TBDA is proving a new paradigm for drug discovery is possible by avoiding redundancy, maximizing efficiency, and overcoming competitive barriers. It's also where the H3D team has made impressive contributions by delivering late lead compounds and closing in on a candidate drug for preclinical development. The second is the malaria drug accelerator, MELDA. Launched in 2017 by ourselves and MMV to accelerate the discovery of novel anti-malarial targets and delivery of early leads. MELDA represents a diverse group of academic and industry partners. And like the TBDA, MELDA offers a new research paradigm that complements existing ways malaria drugs are discovered. To date, the MELDA consortium has identified 22 targets or resistance mechanisms. More than 10 targets have reached the stage of screening and medicinal chemistry optimization. H3D has delivered one of two so-called irresistible leads that are currently being optimized towards preclinical candidates. It's also worth noting that it was a collaborative project sponsored by MMV that provided mentorship support to Kelly's team in their quest to deliver Africa's first homegrown drug candidate, MMV 390048, a novel Plasmodium PI4 kinase inhibitor. This project demonstrated H3D's tremendous capacity to leverage external expertise and collaborate as part of an international team. It's multidisciplinary and multi-sector partnerships like these that are needed to make progress against neglected diseases and increase Africa's capacity to be a global player in pharmaceutical R&D. Building capacity and experience of Africa's drug discovery scientists through direct mentorship and skill building is a promising model for the future and one deserving of expansion. For example, H3D is the anchor partner behind 16 fellowships funded by the Foundation and MMV to advance promising drug discovery projects across the continent. I'm excited to see H3D continue to be an effective conduit between industry and academic research that drives African health innovation forward, as evidenced by today's announcement. Now is the time 
to build on what H3D and consortia like the TB and malaria drug accelerators are proving possible and spur others to expand their efforts in training and supporting nascent drug discovery efforts in Africa. If we hope to meet the needs of over 1 billion people with affordable quality medicines tailored to their needs, many more African scientists must be given a chance to grow and thrive. Thank you. I know that all of you want to hear from the man at the center of all of this, Professor Kelly Chibali. So I'm going to ask Kelly to turn on his camera and we'll get in into a, a chat um, together. Uh, Kelly, there, there he is. Um, Kelly, I know that today is like your engagement party, but you've been at it for a very long time. You you grew up in a rural village in Zambia, but managed to, to get to study chemistry in, in Cambridge. You've had a host of really prestigious posts, but you're currently the, the professor of organic chemistry at the University of Cape Town. You founded a number of, of innovations, as we've heard from the previous two speakers, and you are head of of, of H3D, the Drug Discovery and Development Center at UCT. The mission of H3D is to discover and develop life-saving medicines for diseases that mostly affect African patients, build Africa-specific models to improve treatment outcomes, and to educate African scientists. I know we could talk all day and we only have 15 minutes, so let's just go straight into it. How did H3D start? Well, thanks, Kerry. Thanks, thanks for this opportunity. And of course, to everybody in attendance, uh, thank you for your presence. Well, I guess the, the first thing to say about how did it happen? You know, of course, you know, it's, I guess it's a cliche. You know, they say it all looks easy when you know how, but of course, it's never really easy. I think that really the journey started with uh, the vision. I think God gave me a vision, which I saw this vision. And what is the vision here? It's a vision to basically meet unmet medical needs in Africa, coupled with using science for development to specifically create jobs um, and create an absorptive capacity to allow us to keep talent on the African continent. So it's to identify that talent, to attract it, to develop it, nurture it, and retain it. But secondly, when I saw this vision, I saw it very, very clearly. You gotta see something first before you can touch it. I then recognized and knew what I didn't know about how to discover drugs at the level of infrastructure, at the level really is seeking help from partners of which the first one was Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, along with the government of South Africa, the South African government, to provide the three ingredients I spoke about of infrastructure, technologies, and talent. The rest is history. Kelly, if you could say, what are the two or three most important things that made um, H3D evolve into its current success? I wish you could ask me for eight um, uh, or so, but, but let, let me just give you maybe three or four. I think the first one um, is really, really, when I think about this and I look back with the benefit of hindsight, firstly, it's my home. Where am I? It's the South African government and the leadership of the University of Cape Town. That's where it starts because infrastructure is a building block to everything else you're going to do at the level of projects. So the first thing is South African government support and support from the University of Cape Town. Secondly, it's this model 
network of partnerships model that Trevor Mandel was referring to in his talk. For us, it was partnership between academia, which was myself at the University of Cape Town, pharmaceutical companies, which will become evident as we go along, a product development partnership, as in MMV, and government. But this model, importantly, is recognizing what each partner can do in their home institution based on what they have without wishing they have everything. And what they don't have, the gaps that they have, are then filled and addressed by the partners. And finally, to this model, it's not just capacity building for the sake of it. It's a model that's based on prosecuting projects, getting the job done, and then building capacity. So it's really, really capacity building where it's led by a project that scales through sustained world-class excellence. And that's the second thing I've given you, but let me give you a third because you asked me for three. I wish you could ask me for 10 another time. But the third one really is this. It's again, talking about the theme of partnerships. It's leveraged funding. And I'll give you just a couple of examples of this. The funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the funding that we received from Novartis, from the Novartis Research Foundation, the funding that we received from MMV, that funding was leveraged on a one-to-one -one basis with funding from the South African government. That has been a critical ingredient um, in doing this uh, because it's not just looking to share benefits, but it's also looking to share risks. That's what a partnership is about. You gotta bring something to the table. Those are three, but I can give you more if you need, but let's stop for here for now. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. And I know you can talk forever. So thanks for confiding to you three. Your aim, you spoke about gaps and you, your aim is to become an Africa-wide drug discovery and innovation center. So what are some of the gaps that are still there that need to be filled? So when I focus on the whole value chain, when I talk about the value chain, I'm talking about moving from innovation to access. And everything in between from discovery or to development, this is clinical trials. There are of course always going to be gaps because even the industry sometimes have to rely on these partnerships. You cannot address all the gaps. But if you allow me not to go on forever, but just to say one thing, if there is one really critical ingredient, it's a critical mass of talent critical mass of skilled talent, because when you talk about drug discovery, this is a team-based interdisciplinary science. Integrating, for example, early stage drug discovery, you integrate chemistry in the broad sense with biology in the broad sense and preclinical pharmacology. So it's having scientists skilled in these areas, and of course, other areas that are critical to support supporting the enterprise. I would say arguably critical mass of talent. And if you allow me just one more thing, infrastructure in the broad sense. And when I talk about infrastructure, I am not referring to necessarily to a physical building. Of course, you could have a functional lab, but infrastructure to me goes beyond just a physical building. It's also, can you even order chemicals. This sounds like it's trivial. It's not trivial. Procurement of reagents, we saw it during COVID. People cannot even purchase um, you know, items. You can't even actually donate items easily across borders in Africa. So we're going to remove those barriers because um, you, at the end of the day, you're going to have to make decisions. And those decisions are going to come from when you get data from your experiments. To get a data, you need to do the experiment. To do the experiment, you need the reagents and the chemicals. So if you can't even procure chemicals in good time, I'm sorry, that's a major barrier. I can go on and on and on and on and on, but those two really are my top two. I think we've had a taste, but only a very tiny taste. So if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. And I'm sure that Kelly will be available alongside the, the panel. 
to, to answer any questions. But as Kelly mentioned earlier, scientists can develop perfect drugs, and so, but if you don't have a, the right partnerships, they're not going to go anywhere. They're going to stay in the lab. So we are really delighted to be joined by Glodino Luertz, who's the Director of Health and Innovation in the South African government's Department of Science and Innovation. One of the many things she's responsible for is enabling research and innovation that leads to new drugs and vaccines and treatments. She's at the center of a lot of partnerships and she's going to explain how important partnerships are in capacity building. Claudina, over to you. Sorry, I see it was on mute. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate what uh, Kelly, Trevor Mandel and Dr. Francis Collin has all mentioned. When I really got involved with Kelly was around about 2009, where we start looking at what is needed to build the further capacity in South Africa around malaria drugs. So this is where we started off most of the work was happening outside of South Africa through collaborations. I remember still organizing for Kelly to go to Escaitis in um, Australia, and that ended up then specifically in him being able to, to bring that um, knowledge back to South Africa. Next slide. Next slide. And no, no, one back, please. And then within a very short period of six years through the partnerships that Kelly was able to create, we were actually able to start doing most of that work in-house in South Africa. And to a large extent that then kicked off we, uh, the whole um, H3D group was going to build the capacity, but at the same time to look at products that will be usable in Africa. So drug discovery for Africa, in Africa, and I think that is very, very important. So the malaria activity, the partnership with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as Medicines for Malaria, then created a whole series of different partnerships that were, were developed as such. Next slide. And as was mentioned, the next step was actually the TB drug accelerator. And again, it was working with the NIH, with the Gates Foundation, uh, but building on the strengths in South Africa. But at the same time, we had to sort of see, we can't just leave scientists on their own. We actually need to then see how we can assist them in the process. So the initial work that was created or by Kelly then, next slide, actually then look at how, what else is needed, what are the different capacities. So H3D is one component, it is the leading drug discovery component within South Africa, but we also start to look at what else. That then, we start looking at, yes, now you've got the candidate drugs, what now? So we started to look at API clusters and what is needed to actually go through the process of manufacturing. We also start to look at um, you need, need the diagnostics that goes with it. And so a whole series of ex centers of excellence was then created across South Africa that can then assist in doing health innovation in South Africa. So next slide. So, for example, the one the, the major activity that we now are looking at is now you've got this candidate drug, it's going through clinical trials, what then? Are we going to allow it then to be manufactured outside of Africa and then have to import the, the APIs? Because we all know that the APIs are the main component that's that where the bottlenecks are, and that's also the main um, pricing. Uh, impact that you have. And I think we've all learned our lessons severely through the COVID um, crisis that when things such as plain paracetamol was not available and, and you, you, because you're at the bottom of the feeding line, you, you actually need to start looking at self-reliance. So one of the things that we've created is a small molecule 
uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient cluster and, and to see how we can build on the expertise, not only in medicinal chemistry, but in biology and then also in the chemistry component, then to look into how we can build the industry. But at the same time, as Kelly has mentioned, you need the capacity, you need the people to be trained into the right components. You need the regulator to be able to do the necessary inspections and things like that. And then this, that's why it's also important then to, to assist SAPRA to go beyond uh, the current capacity, but to be actually ML3 level ready and to see what it is needed from that. And through all of this, it was not only the academics in South Africa, but we've been taking hands with your international organizations, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Medicines Patent Pool, MMV, all of that, uh, Medicines for All, all of that to see how we can bring that knowledge into South Africa and then build it as well. So the API cluster is then the next steps on bringing these partnerships. Next slide. But at the same time, when you start looking at, yes, we have a problem with drug resistance TB, you need to have the diagnostics that goes with it. So again, we built a new partnership and to look at how do you build in the industries around medical devices, but specifically on diagnostics as well, to make sure that their diagnostics are appropriate so that you can diagnose the correct disease in order to apply the correct treatment to that. So all of that is sort of what is happening on the moment and uh, we, the partnerships that we are carrying on and expanding on. So basically the initial, Kelly was to a large extent, the trigger that has sort of expanded the um, building of capacity through partnerships then in South Africa. And next slide. And as the African saying is, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think taking hands between the pharmaceutical industry and the academics uh, and the industry in South Africa will take us far. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gradina. I think we can all appreciate that it's a very complicated situation, which is why it helps a great deal to have someone like Rodina in that position to facilitate um, the drugs getting out of the labs and, in, and, and to patients. We now have a panel um, on building innovation in Africa, and we have five guests, including Rodina. So I'm going to ask our guests to turn on their cameras. Um, and I'm going to introduce each guest and ask them to, to, to answer um, a couple of quick questions and then we will put we'll take questions from the audience so i see that there are a couple of, of questions in the chat but please if anything sp sparks um your imagination pop pop a question in in um into the chat um our first guest is david barris who's the vice president and head of global health r d at glaxo smith klein in madrid he focuses on the discovery and development of novel regimens for the treatment of global health diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis. David, what is your connection to H3D and what lessons have you learned from working with an African-based organization? David, are you here? Anyone see David? David, I, yes, he's he's there. Oh, there you. Are. We can't hear you. David, can you hear us? Can you? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Great. That was a tough start. I I hope I can recover quickly. So uh, I was just thanking you for the kind invitation uh, to be here. So the, your first question, your first question is uh, how do we how do we work with H3D and what would what do we do? So Trevor Trevor made a great a great um, announcement of the things that we have been doing with H3D as GSK is one of the partners in the MALDA, is one of the partners in the TBDA, and we are also actively involved with the MALDA. So our experience working with H3D, it is the scientists that are working there 
are fully professional, super engaged, and and always with a willingness to meet what is requested. So we have got a project uh, <clears throat> that uh, were based on the discovery of new anti-malarial or new anti-tuberculosis drugs, and the experience working with the scientists in, in H3D has been awesome. And uh, a great delivery and a great, uh, I, I, would, I would outline their uh, unique commitment. So you can feel when the people, it's naturally with, with a personal thrive to, uh, to, to discover the new drugs, which is very challenging. And, and beyond that, I would like to outline the stress that, that Kelly did on the importance of the infrastructures. So I would say, that uh, we wanted to, to perform clinical trials uh, in a different way. And we wanted to have uh, a new imaging techniques. And, and Kelly uh, was, was uh, critical for us to become uh, conducting clinical trials with the same technologies that are used in oncology. So we managed to have in the University of Cape Town, the last generation of uh, uh, PET scanning to conduct clinical trials. So when you have a good idea and this vision, you can make things happen and push to the frontiers. And it is, this is very important. So the people doesn't do this because they care about it. It's just simply because you can do it. And I think that's something that Kelly always managed to engage with others. And I think H3D is a fantastic flag to change the rhythm at which uh, speed and research in Africa might happen in the future. Thank you so much, David. So from Madrid to Switzerland, we are um, speaking to Jutta Reinhardt Rupp, who's the head of Merck Global Health, and her focus is on the discovery and development of innovative health solutions for the most vulnerable populations, including um, children. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks for participating in, in this panel. Um, yeah, our focus in, in the Institute at Merck is really on most vulnerable populations, so young children. And um, one of the diseases that is still the most uh, um, uh, killing disease for, for young children is really uh, malaria. And uh, we have a focus on, on malaria, on, on you anti-malarials and in 2017 um, we started our collaboration with H3D together with MMV, they were mentioned earlier by Kelly and I think we applied the principles that Kelly was mentioning quite nicely. Um, it's a five-year collaboration on drug discovery. Um, it's a partnership. We leveraged funding from the German government to, to run this. So we have matching funds from the German government. Um, we train students and there's an interesting uh, side aspect, I would say, but an important side aspect in this collaboration besides the, the drug discovery aspect is we have every year three master students in this program from other universities, so not from Cape Town, but from universities in Africa that are less well resourced and that get a chance to dig into this project. So it's what Kelly was saying, it's to have a project. You can only build capacity or strengthen capacity with a concrete project. So our experience in a nutshell, we are, we are very happy with this collaboration. We are uh, considering to renew. We have we have results, which is encouraging. And um, to get back to the niece of Colin in the beginning, I think uh, there, there is very much chance and hope to have excitement about drugs coming out of, of Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jutta. Our next guest speaker is Patrice Machaba, who's the head of, of US Corporate Responsibility and the president of Novartis US Foundation. And he seeks to make its, uh, Novartis's medicines and healthcare solutions accessible to all, regardless of geography, income, or the limitations of their local health systems. Patrice, what is your connection to H3D and what partnerships are important for those involved in African drug innovation? So thanks, Kerry, and, uh, and just thanks to uh, Kelly, H3D Foundation and IPMA for for inviting us and, and setting up this meeting. And sometimes we need a crisis to get together, right? Uh, and, and I'm saying that because uh, I, I'm actually a, a citizen of Africa and a citizen of the world, born in Zimbabwe, lived in South Africa, Lesotho, Botswana, 
Ghana, and now the US and, and, and Switzerland, and they've been doing drug development for the last 20 years. And, 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 and just to make a comment, uh, some of you may not know this, that Trevor Mandel actually is from Johannesburg uh, and is a very good friend. And the point I'm trying to make here is that what Kelly has started with the H3D Foundation is that we have the intellectual capital to generate research and development throughout the whole ecosystem from drug discovery right up down to uh, make it in, uh, access, access, accessible. Our partnership with Novartis uh, and H3D started in 2012, and the right up to 2018 with the Novartis Research Foundation, providing seed capital uh, <clears throat> um, to, to, to work with MMV. I know David is on there. We're still working together with, uh, with MMV and malaria uh, and Kelly to set up the capabilities to do drug discovery and first in human phase one capabilities, FDA compliance. We have exchanged uh, researchers. It's important to always have a project. We've exchanged researchers uh, coming to Switzerland with the next generation scientists. We have our Novartis Institute of Biological Research in Boston with more than 6,000 discovery scientists uh, exchanging with Kelly's team and, and, and vice versa. We've helped also with the uh, you know, or organizational issues related to matrix organization. So it's been comprehensive. And I visited, Kelly's a good friend. I visited Kelly's unit several times in Cape Town. But what's been frustrating for me, and I'll just say two or three things, um, uh, Kerry, um, as, as an African citizen and a global citizen, is that, that what next? So we do the drug discovery, but what is the next thing? And for me, the next is, how do we develop translational medicine capabilities? Because science for the sake of science is meaningless. It must be applied uh, uh, to, to high disease, unmet need areas. The second thing for me is that we need to address this intellectual property issue. So Africa has been leading in terms of mining with you know, mining technology and banking technology. We need to respect IP. Otherwise, our scientists that are coming from Africa and H3D cannot create the kind of venture capital structures that allow them to, over the 10 years to put money or capital at risk to develop that. And we'll, we'll discuss this in, in, in the Q&A. And then of course, this must be an African issue. And, and, and this comes to the question then of regulatory harmonization that we need because science is moving so fast. I'll just end with one slide that Trevor showed from discovery to COVID vaccines, a couple of months. That's the speed that we need to generate within Africa. Thanks so much, Patrice. The man after my own heart, action. Um, we, we, we heard earlier from Claudine Lewitz, Director of Health Innovation at the South African Government's Department of Science and Innovation. Claudine, I just wanted to touch, go, return briefly to you to, to ask you how you how the South African government has worked specifically with H3D to facilitate um, its work. We, the initial funding to actually create H3D came from the South African government and then combined that with partnerships that was created when Colin Pillay was still at Novartis, but also with, with, uh, with MMV, because one of the important things is we cannot expect on to have handouts. We actually need to put in our money where our mouth is. And I think that's important. We've made money available. We've made opportunities available. We made partnerships available, but if it's not for the good signs, then those would have been fruitless. And I think it was a good partnership because we, we try to assist where necessary to open doors um, where we can, to use political um, influences, but also at the same time to look at what funding is needed, what opportunities can be created through that. And similarly, yeah, we 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 now gone beyond what Kelly is doing, and and we're starting to look at what are the next level of uh, therapies like immunotherapy and so on. What's needed, but what does it take? So we built in we put infrastructure as well as uh, funding for scholarships, 
in place then to to build that and and i think that is what sort of assisted Kelly to 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 fast track what he wants to do thank you thanks Claudine. um so it's not only important to have good relations with government but to enable government to also invest in your in your project the our, our, our final panelist is is belinda Boudou, who's the head of africa in, in of the africa engagement committee at the ifpma and she's responsible for managing the committee's local production task force and the partnership with h3d foundation belinda what has impressed you the most about h3d's record of innovation and capacity Hi, thanks, Kerry, and hi, everyone. Uh, just a, a little correction on my side. I am on the Climate currently from Eli Lilly. I'm leading the Africa Engagement Committee work on local production um, and this partnership with, with the University of Cape Town and the HUB Foundation. Uh, wow, I mean, um, when I was given this assignment in April, um, it reminded me of when I went for an interview to be admitted to university, I went to this. Um, and they asked me what I wanted to do and what I dreamed of. And um, I said I wanted to find a cure for HIV, which was so topical at the time. I'm giving my age away, no, but um, that was what I wanted to do. That is what I grew up wanting to be, a scientist. And, and in my career, I've had the opportunity to, to meet real-life drug inventors. And Prof Kelly is one of those. And he's not just a drug inventor, he's an African drug inventor. Um, he personifies what many of our children dream of. Um, and unfortunately, the opportunities to grow in that field are not necessarily here, but he's trying to build that. So that people like Patrice and Trevor are not all over the world scattered around the world, but they can actually live and build their dreams here on the continent being a scientist, discovering drugs. We lack not the, the intellectual capacity, so many have said it already. Um, we lack the resources and the infrastructure um, and, uh, and the vision. And that's what I appreciate about uh, H3D, the H3D Foundation, and specifically Prof Kelly. He has personified that vision, um, that Africa can do it. And it is so necessary, Claudina has already said, that we were at the back end of the field because we don't have those capabilities on the continent. And the next pandemic shouldn't catch us there. In the next pandemic, it's partnerships like this that's going to build that infrastructure, that's going to strengthen the capacity so that we, as Africans, um, are the ones that in the future come up with the cures because we're certainly capable of it. The H3D, H3D has shown us that the capabilities are there, and we are here to support them very proudly. So, I the IFPMA. Thank you. Thanks so much, Belinda. And sorry, I didn't mention your secondment as well. Um, so, there's some really interesting questions that are coming through in the chat. So, instead of me going for another round of ask, asking the um, our, our panelists questions, I think I, I'd like to move straight on to the, the questions from the chat so that people um our panelists can can answer them and i'm also going to ask kelly to join um the panel because the um some of the questions are, are obviously directed at him um there's a question here which says so far the speakers have been focused on north south collaborations would h3d aim to also establish south south collaborations and that comes from Ives gonzalez uh i think kelly would be the right person to take that if you don't mind yeah, I, I couldn't wait to answer that question. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for the question. I will just give one example of exactly what you're talking about. Um, so this is a program that we started uh, a few years ago with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with the Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, the African Academy of Sciences, and H3D. And this is the Grand Challenges Africa program, whose vision really is about expanding the ecosystem and community of drug discovery scientists on the continent, but also using the experiences of H3D 
the expertise, the infrastructure to exactly do what I was describing at the beginning, where when I knew what I didn't know about how to do drug discovery, I recognized what the gaps were at the level of infrastructure, technologies, and talent. So this program, which is really generously supported and funded by the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and Trevor Mandel actually made reference to the 16 scientists who have received funding from this program. And these scientists are actually based all across the African continent. But H3D is basically the focal point in terms of driving this, not just bringing the experiences from the last 11 years or so, but also providing access to our infrastructure and collaborating on actual projects where the center of gravity is at those African institutions so that they can also take the same journey that we have taken, starting small on a project and scaling up through world-class excellence. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. There's a question from Lemire, which says, what is your strategy? This is addressed to all the panelists, but I think Claudina will have to start. What is your strategy for the, I guess, addressing the differences across the continent regarding regulations for both registrations and clinical studies? I know that there's been the African Medicines Agency, which has been trying to get off the ground for quite some time, and even South Africa hasn't um, ratified it yet. So maybe, Glodina, you could kick off and say, um, how, how do you think, coming from South Africa, there could be some kind of harmonization of regulations across the continent? And then I'll see whether any of the other um, panelists want to um, add, add their voice to that. Yeah. Um Yes, you've mentioned the African uh, Medicines Agency, but we're also working, for example, um, closer to home, Zazibona, where we're looking at the harmonization specifically of the regulatory uh, components as such. Um, I'm working with a group within the African Union where we're looking at how to harmonize the um, regulatory components. And we also then looking uh, with assistance from FDA, uh, EMA, as well as Swiss Medic to, to see what capacities can be built. And not only in South Africa, but also then for other regulatory authorities. And within the next month, there will be a number of sort of announcements on where we are we going, what are we doing, what are the opportunities for training to build this capacity then that will feed into the uh, African Medicines Authority. But because you are sitting with each country being autonomous, you, you have to also uh, uh, acknowledge their ability then to make their own regulatory environments. Similarly, with regard to clinical trials, from the African CDC side, the COVID has actually initiated a whole network of um, clinical trial centers across Africa that, again, there's certain levels to see also how you can then assist different clinical trial sites to become um, there's, there's different levels and what which each one can do, but how can we then make sure that we build the capacity and at the same time uh, say that, yes, we can do the clinical trials in Africa, but what is important, not only can we do the clinical trials, but we can also do the laboratory analysis in South Africa. The genetic samples do not need to leave Africa. It can be retained in Africa. For I know that's becoming more and more an issue as well is, uh, the genetics that's leaving being piratized from Africa and so on. So we also need to, if we want to scream about something, we also need to, to say, but what are, uh, as Africa, what are we doing then to build that capacity? Similarly, on with regard to genomic research and uh, immunotherapies, that are applicable. Similarly, we, we're looking at what can be done. How can we do whole genome sequencing in Africa, make that available across Africa? So it's not only on regulatory, but it's the complementary science to the regulatory and to the drug discovery that we are slowly building that capacity across Africa. 
Thanks, Rodina. Patrice, I know that you have a fair bit to say about um, regulatory har harmonization. Yeah, yeah no, the thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Rodina. And uh, just to say, you know, um, we had very good discussions with Minister Naledi Pando when, when she was head of uh, the science and technology, and she understood these issues. There is a sense of urgency, and we've seen this with COVID, right? That the science is moving so rapidly, and 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 that to to have to go through 54 different dossiers in 54 different African countries to get access to a vaccine, which is a messenger RNA, and upskill our regulatory teams is impossible. So the urgency to harmonize is there. And the Africa Free Trade Agreement that is coming in is the perfect opportunity to harmonize and to create a 1.2 billion market for our African scientists so that scientists that come out throughout Africa and H3D have the uh, kind of uh, ecosystem that supports them to scale to do so. That's one thing. The second thing is, is also speed to regulatory decisions. If I tell you that a small country like Belgium has the highest per capita investment when it comes into discovery and first in human trials. And the reason is this, there's a deliberate decision the Belgian government took when you apply to do a first in human trial and a clinical trial approval, they give you a yes or no in two weeks. In two weeks, because speed is everything in this industry. Particularly if you're going to grow young African scientists, they're going to have to borrow money from venture capital, just like what happened in Singapore, what has happened in Switzerland. By the way, Singapore has got a population of three and a half million. We've got 1.2 billion. What is stopping us from making these decisions and saying the time is right to create that? Now, I'll give you one example. What we've started doing as Novartis is identifying African regulatory authorities that understand that science that is driven just like H by H3D organically is important. We registered a messenger RNA medicine in Accra at the same time with the FDA. It is possible. It is possible. And we need to be really transparent and say, we can do better when it comes to this, because it's not an issue of in, uh, the industry, whether it's, and, and Glodin has said it, Emma, Swiss Medic, FDA, IPMA are all willing to help to build the capabilities so that HDD and African scientists can be successful. Thanks so much, Patrice. There are a couple of questions relating to access for young um, for young scientists. We have Philbert, who's who's a Rwandan of Rwandan origin, and he wants to know how he can get in contact. How does he wants to contribute to to working on the African continent? So how can he be in con contact with 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 H three D and and and, and get access to, to working on the content. I think I'm gonna ask you to, 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 uh, to speak a little bit about some of the opportunities um, for, for, for young African scientists and then maybe Kelly to come in after that. Thank you, thank you, yes. I think this, um, this um, aspect of um, critical mass of talents, that, that is really uh, key here. And talents, you can train them in Africa. And I think H3D is, is a very good um, example here. There are other, there are other options. Uh, we, have, we have trainees in the company. They come and join us uh, for half a year, for a year. Um, there are programs like um, EDCTP fellowship programs where you uh, can join um, industry or uh, NGOs around the globe with, with the idea behind that um, people go back into their country to bring the expertise back into their country. Um, we, we have in Germany a very special program called Africa Compt. So means Africa comes <laughs> for, for young scientists. They spend a year in Germany in the diversity of companies. They also go back and I, I saw so many successful candidates uh, that I think, yes, there, there are opportunities. And I, I think Kelly may, may want to add here from, from the H3D perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Jutta. Yeah, so just to add to that, um, in fact, 
the a few mechanisms that I think are possible in this case. So over and above what Yuta mentioned, um, we actually from time to time host people who come here on sabbatical. So currently, for example, we have um, um, a program with um, the other MEC, not Utah's MEC, but the other MEC in North America, uh, where for the last two years and, and this year as well, I've basically seconded the scientists who are working with H3D on specific programs. Uh, and so that's one mechanism where there are actual opportunities, including the ones that Utah was, was mentioning. But also something to keep in mind is that if you actually come to H3D, and this is a very important message that we happen to be physically based in Cape Town. But if you look at where the talent comes from, and Utah was referring to this when she was talking about our programs and, and the students that at Merck, uh, her company's funds to work in, in my lab for their PhDs or masters who come from Ghana, Kenya, and other countries. But if you look at the staff complement of H3D, it's a rainbow, just like uh, South Africa, a rainbow nation. We have talent from North America. We brought in industry talent, which has been critical for success, investing in leadership, but also we have talent from many other parts of Africa, because this is the place at this point in time where people can do this kind of work. This is not to say it cannot happen anywhere else, but at this point in time, this is the place where it's happening. So if you support us, anything that the Gates Foundation or Merck or anybody is doing to support us, you are actually supporting Africa uh, because we, the staff here, we cannot get enough talent from within South Africa. So yeah, so those are the mechanisms that are available to come and spend in sabbatical and contribute. Thank you. Thanks so much. As Dr. Collins said, Africa is rising. And so now is the time. We have an interesting question from Christopher Ware, who says Africa has one of the most diverse genetic makeup. And similarly, we know with gene therapy and immunotherapy needs customization for the African patient. Do we have the institutions and capacity to develop the, these kinds of therapies? Or should we be partners as a continent for clinical trials only? Kelly, that's tailor-made for you. Um, I think it's for me and Patrice. Uh, so I'll let Patrice deal with the gene therapy aspect. But let me deal with the genetics aspect and actually address that from um, a drugs perspective. I think the question, one aspect of the question is around gene therapy. And I'll let Patrice speak to that. But on the issue of customizing medicines for the African patient population, this is so, so, so important. Firstly, if you just look at, I think COVID is a very good reminder of this and social media, how this misinformation and disinformation about vaccines or clinical trials. What people don't realize is, is this, that historically, although Africa makes up about 15, 20% of the global population, less than 2% of clinical trials actually happen on the continent. The consequence of this is that the African perspective in terms of intrinsic factors like our genetics, which is of course this question about, but also the way that we practice medicine is not considered. So how do we remedy that? How do we make sure that vaccines or biologics or small molecules are really, really optimized for this population? When I say optimized, Africa is arguably the most genetically diverse continent. So when we talk about not harmonizing, but optimizing medicines, we got to, first of all, not only increase the number of clinical trials happening on the continent, but we also have to increase the number of Africans participating in those clinical trials, because the data that comes from there is in our best interest. So we know what is the optimal dosages or dosing regimens or dosing frequency that's optimal for our population. That's why it's important. But on the other hand, at the preclinical level, and when Kerry, not quite my namesake, but almost my namesake, uh, Kerry, when she was introducing the, uh, what we do at H3D in terms of developing preclinical tools is exactly this. How do we develop tools that factor in the genetics of the African population? So that as we do the discovery, we prioritize those small molecules based upon their predicted 
pharmacological profile in African patients. And that's why we are undertaking this project that I've had the pleasure to talk to Kerry about, the African drug metabolism, uh, because we know some of the variability that we see in the way the African patient populations respond to medicines is because of genetic differences in the expression and activity of the so-called drug metabolizing enzymes. So that actually is a way that we're going to address this health equity issue. Increase the number of clinical trials in Africa. They are not trying to kill us as Africans. We have to take part in clinical trials because they're not just health benefits. They're also economic benefits because when a clinical trial is brought to your country, somebody has to pay for it and that creates jobs. So it's not just health, it's also economics. I will ask uh, maybe Patrice to comment on the gene therapy aspect. No, no, absolutely. I mean, Africa is the most genetically diverse and, and, and Kelly is correct. What we have learned is that the best way to build a healthcare system, and it goes to what Glodina and, and, and Judah and my colleagues have been saying, is participate in the clinical trials. So we have three gene therapies on the market already around the world, right? Imagine if African countries had participated in those studies to deliver the gene therapies. We would have developed the lab capabilities to manage and manipulate those gene therapies or cell therapies or immunotherapies and so on. Now, uh, secondly, we, we, actually today, uh, uh, David's company, uh, my colleague and ourselves, <laughs> actually sponsoring a partnership with the Medical Research Council to look at um, uh, various uh, uh, studies looking at the, the genotypes and then handling of drugs in the African continent. And you'll, you'll, you'll get to know more about this, but it has to be bigger. And then as Solomon and, a, and some colleagues of ours who, who are really interested in gene therapies, um, as, as Francis Collins has, has, has mentioned, there's also the H3 African uh, grouping of scientists that are collecting uh, bloods for genotyping. Now, ironically, ironically, we just launched the sickle cell uh, a partnership uh, with, uh, for Africa because the number one genetic cause of ill health in Africa is sickle cell disease. 80% of the population is there. So we've partnered with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to start looking at gene therapies for sickle cell and with the Ghanaian government and including Tanzania, and it is going to include 10 African countries. But here's the, here, here, here's the message, and this is the key message from Kelly. We need to participate in the clinical trials. No one is trying to steal blood or some intellectual property from Africa, take it somewhere and customize it somewhere. If we want to develop the ability to do those gene studies in our own country, we should create the regulatory environment to do so because we have the scientists who can look at the genetic material and they will develop because of these multiple ecosystem partnerships. There are a lot of people on these calls who are willing to help scientifically, but we have to take the lead and create this kind of partnership with H3D and IFPMA. Thanks so much, Patrice. Before I take another question, I'm going to go back to David because he had hardly, he hasn't had much of a chance. And I'm going to ask <laughs> David specifically because you are involved in innovations all over the world and partnerships all over the world. For you, what what is the benefit of working with a diverse group of, of researchers from, from, from all of, of, of the world to, um, to work on drug innovation? So, so we, we said at the company that we are, we let the science to guide us. And, and obviously, innovation doesn't have a home. Innovation comes uh, from anywhere. And, and obviously, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't understand genetics, the innovation. It is, it is elsewhere. So on that, on that front, uh, when we establish a collaboration or a partnership, we don't look at, uh, at uh, where are you coming from. We just look at the science that you have. And, and I would like to say a couple, a couple of things, Kerry, very quickly. On this random uh, uh, scientist that was asking uh, how, to, how to participate uh, well, and how to, how to work. So I would put as an example the, the Tuscantos Open Lab Foundation uh, as, as a very good engine to work with Kelly, to work with GSK, where if you have an idea, you can still own your idea and come 
to work with us, together with us, setting our resources. Uh, but you keep your own research as yours, and 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 Kelly can give can be the port port of call and 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 and, and do this um, in, in practical terms. And and then on the pharmacogenomics, uh, Kelly, I think this is super important. I think uh, getting closer to a precision medicine. Uh, this this looks like a distant dream, uh, but infectious diseases. What? Why not? Is that if we do not start to go into the right direction, we will never be there. And as Patrice was saying before, I am missing these other very important meeting I was supposed to attend uh, uh, on the fermic gradient with uh, all the proposals from uh, um, African partners will be presented and and evaluated to move forward. And I think this is a great beginning to uh, start paving the way. So things are happening and it's just this component of when the translational aspects, uh, how how does it happen? How how do we bring this to fruition? And I think we need we need a nucleus as, and, and, and you need to make it attractive. And sometimes it's, it's the infrastructure, the, the technology. So the scientists goes wherever they can do their job. Um, and where things are happening. And I think building a hub, building somewhere, it may be linked to R&D uh, manufacturing capacity in Africa, that's a good beginning. We just need to go for a hubs, and then and then it's a good good way to start because scientists attract, attract science and another scientist as well. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you so much, David. There's, there are a couple of questions about funding. So I'm gonna ask, a quick response on that um just to combine the questions basically sometimes drug development takes a long time and how can african um scientists attract um funding that that can sustain their projects um so that they um the, so that they have the time needed so i'm not sure who would like to take that question possibly kelly possibly anybody yeah, yeah i don't mind i can i can i can take it just from the experience so so first of all um I'm at the risk of opening a can of worms about uh, decolonization, which is you know, the buzzword people like to use these days. But this is my view of decolonization, yeah? As an African, no one stops me from thinking, no one stops me from deciding what I need to do, and no one can stop me from prioritizing my budget to put towards whatever I want to do. That's the first starting point. So. The model I mentioned earlier in response to Kerry's question about what have been the critical ingredients for success, the one I mentioned was leveraged funding. This is always about partnership. And when I talk about partnership, it's not always about the cash. And this is really, I'm, I'm making an appeal to African governments. I'm making an appeal that it's not always about the money. It's also about the right policies that make it attractive for partners to want to do your research in your own country. So there's a lot, and I'm not apportioning blame. I'm just saying the model that we really, really believe in is you not just share benefits, share in the risks, because that's what a partnership is about. But it's not always about bringing money to the table. A government can just have the right policies to make it attractive for science to be done. The infrastructure, remove the barriers, let people import chemicals, let them arrive. Don't refuse equipment people have donated and you want to charge customs. Small little things like that. Because at the end of the day, we live in a very competitive world. Life doesn't owe me as an African anything. You gotta fight for it. And the way to do it is to be competitive. And I think this is about a partnership model. So governments, should be encouraged to follow the example of the South African government that I gave the example to, how this has enabled us to expand the team and the pot of money because it's everybody's contributing something. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. I think that's a perfect way to end the panel and to move into the next section. So thanks to the amazing panelists, all the questions. There were some lovely comments as well, encouraging comments, people saying how they, they're so happy to... To, to feel the, this optimism um, coming out. So, so, so clearly we achieved um, what we intended to. The next speaker we've, we've heard from previously, she was on this panel, Belinda Boudou. She is now going to elaborate 
on what the H3D Foundation and the IFPMA partnership entails and what it means for, for health innovation. Thanks, Belinda. Thank you, Kerry. Hi, everyone again. Um, it is such a pleasure and a privilege to announce this partnership today. Um, it's been in the, in the works for a while. Um, the brainchild of Prof Kelly and um, our own Gilham Sintra, who is our Director of Innovation, um, they uh, came up with this idea of partnering and using the strength of both organizations to really shine the light on drug development um, on the continent. Um, just a little reminder for everyone, the IFPMA, we can move to the next slide, thanks Charles. The IFPMA is, um, what we try to do is to promote sustainable solutions that will encourage innovation and will improve patients' health around the world. Um, we represent research-based biopharmaceutical companies, um, and uh, we also represent uh, regional and um, global um, associations across the world. Um, we are engaged with health and research players to facilitate the co-creation of sustainable policies and initiatives that encourage the discovery of and access to medicines and vaccines for patients globally. On the HCD Foundation side, um, we know, we have heard it so, so many times today, that most African nations have limited capacity uh, within a very complex drug innovation ecosystem. Uh, we also know that there's a need for locally driven drug discovery response, both during a pandemic, but also to meet our ongoing health needs. And with this in mind, um, the S3D Foundation uh, wants to create an absorptive capacity for securing, building and retaining skilled African scientists within innovative R&D. They want to ensure the skills that Africa will need to move into the next decade um, as it seeks to become more self-reliant and to become a global player in innovative pharmaceutical R&D. So to put it short, what they want to do is to develop sustainable capacity building in drug innovation and science in Africa. And today, these two organizations are coming together um, within the IFPMA's um, context or objective of building an innovation culture on the continent. We've not just partnered with um, the IF, uh, with HGD, we've also partnered with um, uh, various other organizations on the Young Africa Innovators for Health Awards. Um, and we've also established um, a global chair uh, with Yonde University. Um, and these are other partnerships that Greg alluded, alluded to earlier. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the details of this partnership. So we are announcing a three-year partnership aimed at strengthening capacity for health innovation on the continent. Um, we will combine forces to focus on driving capacity strengthening for drug discovery and development in Africa by scaling existing initiatives and identifying new in opportunities for young and mid-career scientists in the region. The IFPMA will be an anchor partner. We will provide short to medium support, uh, term support in increasing awareness around the A3D Foundation's activities. And we hope we've, we've started in doing this today and to develop and strengthen the capacity for human resources for health innovation in Africa. We will facilitate networking and visibility across the innovation ecosystem through our membership and offer opportunities for collaboration from drug development to market. And then together, this partnership aims to call attention to drug innovation and access in the region. And both of these are key pillars to achieving sustainable development goals and universal health coverage. So we are so excited. We know that drug innovation does not exist in a vacuum. Partnership, partnership, partnership is one of the themes that have come through today. Um, from the beginning, that's what Prof Kelly said, whether it was the partnership with the South African government, the partnership with other private sector partners, uh, our members here on the line today, represented today. Um, that partnership is, is what's gonna bring us there and make sure that the drug discovery the continent needs is, is gonna be in place and hopefully um, before the next pandemic hits. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, uh, but we are so proud of this moment. Thank you for this opportunity. 
Um, and we are really looking forward to, to just continuing to tell the story of drug innovation and exposing and showing you all the great work that's happening on the continent. Um, as Glodina also says, the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I'm indeed proud to be an African today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belinda. I think that we're all proud. I think this has been a fantastic launch. At the start, there were more than 220 people online. So the, there's massive interest and the engagement in the, on the chat was also fantastic. Not only people asking questions, but just saying how encouraged they felt. So thanks to everybody. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, um, this has been recorded and the IFPMA will be writing, doing a write-up fr from it. So if people want further information, um, it, it's available. And I think I'm going to hand over to, to Colin um, for, the, for the final words. Thanks, everybody. So Kerry, is it only because I'm sitting in Switzerland that we're finishing on time? Amazing. <laughs> so... Kerry, thank you so much. Uh, in, in today's meeting, we, we listened to recorded messages from Trevor and Francis. Uh, we listened to a really inspiring conversation between Kerry and Kelly. Uh, we joined a panel discussion and we heard or read comments and questions from you. Uh, some of those questions were already um, answered and discussed during the, the panel. I tried my best also to, to put some comments as we went through. Uh, throughout, we heard recurring themes of why partnerships are critical for health innovation in Africa. Uh, so to, in, in, in helping to bring this meeting to end, uh, let me go all the way back to Greg Perry's note at the beginning, uh, where he thanked the, the group that was involved. And so I want to just add a one-time big thank you to the many, many people who worked hard in the background. Many of them were not on the panel or in this meeting uh, to get to this meeting to the, to the quality that you just experienced. Uh, I'll also apologize to them because I'm not gonna be naming them uh, one by one. But most importantly for me, uh, Kerry just, just pointed it out. I've been watching the list of participants as well. Uh, really impressive, I mean, busy people, making the time to join, to make comments. Uh, this is impressive, really, really impressive. Uh, so with that, it just brings me to want to come back to the opportunity to repeat the call uh, on behalf of Kelly and the team at H3D that his group is ready and open for collaborations and partnerships to strengthen science in Africa. Uh, as Kelly said uh, just a couple of minutes ago, while it's important, it's not always about the money. Uh, so with that, you've seen the messages uh, on the chat about how you can get in touch. Please get in touch, stay in touch. Thanks very much. <laughs>